Well, good morning, Liberty Church. Oh, y'all so quiet and stuff. We're go- we'll work on it. We'll work on it. It'll be fine. Uh, I know it's because the beautiful thing that we just watched. I tried really to not watch Allison and everybody up here because that just messed me up in Sunday 8, the whole going through the stages. Woo, okay. It was beautiful. Great job. Great job. Um, so I am excited and honored to be speaking this morning, and I am really pumped because I feel like the Lord gave me a very clear word that has not just been speaking to me for a long time, but also that I think is very necessary to the body of Christ. And let me tell you, I have never had this much warfare over a word before ever. Been preparing for a word. I have been struggling. I have had so many moments of just chaos in my heart and in my soul. And, you know, first I'm just chalking it up to being busy. You know, May is crazy, uh, especially for moms and graduations and camp and all these things coming up that I was just like, oh, it's just all of that. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, you know, when you listen to the Holy Spirit for a second. And I realized, no, it's because the, the word that the Lord has is such a place that the enemy does not want us to be free in. It's such a place of healing that defies the powers of this world. Um, that he's calling us to this today. So y'all don't mind if I preach myself a little happy, okay? Because this word has been ministering to me a lot in the last few weeks. And I would love for you to join Pastor Russell and come along with me on this ride. I hear you. (laughs) Um, It is also a word that I feel like there's a little special anointing for the moms in here today for Mother's Day, because it is such a word that is very needed for us from you amazing grandmothers and great-grandmothers to spiritual moms, there's so many of you in here, to future moms, for those of you wrestling, so desiring to be a mom, to grieving moms, to single moms, to happy and fulfilled moms, to stressed out of their mind mamas. This word is for you today. And if you think, because that's not you, it doesn't apply to you. Well, there's another story. So join me for the ride, even if you're not one of those incredible moms. I'm going to start with an odd question. It's rhetorical. You don't need to lift your hand. You don't need to answer. But just think about this for a second. How many of you would say, I have so much free time. My plate is so empty, and I wish I had more things going on. Again, it's rhetorical. I hear the chuckles. <laughs> I understand that for some of us, a very few of us, that might actually resonate probably with someone on the much younger side or perhaps a lot older. But for most of us, nothing could be further from the truth, right? We have more on our plate than we could have ever wanted. We are stressed out. We are busy. We are exhausted. Would that be a little bit more accurate statement? <laughs> So this is where we're going this morning. We are starting in Psalm 46. Verse 7 starts with the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty, he says it again, is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What? Amen. Hallelujah. What an incredible promise these verses are, that he starts by reminding us again that God is with us, that he is our shelter, our fortress, and our strong tower. And in the midst of all of this, he talks about the wars and and the bows and all these things. He pauses and says, be still. And know that I am God. Now we're going to break down this particular phrase here today. And let's start with the first part. Two little words. Be still. This has got to be one of the most countercultural statements you can possibly make in Western civilization. Am I right? We do everything but this. We, we hear words and we say words like we got to grind. We got to rise to the top. We got to climb the corporate ladder. We got to work. No days off. Sleep is for chumps. Things like this, right? I saw a shirt literally yesterday on a lady that said, no days off. Not biblical. (laughs) But this is what we tend to in our chaotic world consider synonymous with success. Hustle, 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 grind, grind, grind. Now, please, a little caveat here, do not get me wrong. This is not an excuse to just chill and do nothing. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. So nobody be using me as an excuse. Well, Pam said that I can just chill and do nothing. That is not what I'm saying here. But I do think that there's a really important lesson for us to learn. And we're going to jump in to what God is actually saying when he says, be still. First of all, let's notice that it is a command. 
very first thing that you say. He doesn't say, well, I think it might be a good idea if you stop a little bit or, you know, it might be a good thing to do. No, he stops and declares, be still. Other translations say, stand silent, cease striving, be quiet. The message says, step out of the traffic. I like that one. This is imperative. And not only is this a command, it is a command in the midst of chaos. It's fascinating that this powerful command comes in the middle of him talking about desolation, wars, bows being broken, shears being, spears being shattered, shields being burned with fire. And then God comes in the midst of this intense chaos and warfare and brings the powerful command to be still. See, God knows that we need to learn to be still in every season, but how much more so when there's such external or internal chaos in our lives. Amen? Amen. And number three, it is something to fight for. It is something we have to fight for. It reminds me of the story in Mark 4. You all know it where Jesus is in the boat. He's asleep. The disciples are in the boat and the storm just comes out of nowhere. And the huge Huge waves are breaking in the boat and water's getting in there and the disciples are freaking out of their mind. Meanwhile, where's Jesus? Sound asleep. And it says that they run to Jesus and they come shouting at him. Just, just, just picture this for me. He was just happy, lullaby on the, wait, on the waves and the disciples run over. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you see what's going on? I hear some chuckles, right? It's kind of a funny picture, but how... Often do we have those same moments where we're like, are you, a, are you asleep? Don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you care that I'm drowning in this chaos and all of these things in my life? Don't you see me? And what does it say that Jesus does? In Mark 4, 39, it says, he got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Sometimes... Many times we have got to follow in the footsteps of our King Jesus and get up, rebuke the turmoil going on inside and outside of us and command it to be still. Amen. Amen. It is something we have to fight for. And you know, for the majority of us, we, we don't, we don't know how to be still. We don't know how to pause, how to unplug. And God is calling us to this today. I came across this statement a few weeks ago and it just stopped me in my tracks and I had to write it down. It said, most of us will work harder on making sure our devices are re recharged more than we are. Can I, can I say that again? So for some of us that are slower processors, most of us will work harder on making sure our devices are recharged more than we are. And how true is that? We have our iPhones, we have our, our computers, our, our gadgets, and, and they're at 5%. We're like, oh my gosh, I need a charger. Where's the, why do you know somebody got it? Anybody, anybody plug anything? And we run around chaotically looking for it. However, we might be at 5% spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally. We're like, uh, we'll get to that later, right? I was reading some statistics on rest and body recovery, and it said of Americans in 2024, about 33% of people report feeling extreme stress and up to 73% report that stress impacts their mental health. It's funny how we kind of all know this. We know it's health, not healthy or wise for us to be at a high level of stress all of the time. And then we as followers of Christ know that God commands us to, to rest and to be still. But we often kind of just shrug it off as a non-essential or we just don't get to it. But how many of you guys know in here that if the Lord commands it, it is never non-essential. That we gotta listen when he tells us something. Now, I don't wanna stop right here and keep talking about be still because there's a lot that comes that is super powerful there's a little word that comes after be still. And I want to just talk about it for a second. What does it say? It says be still and, and. Let's be a little uh, grammar nerds here for a second. Just bear with me. What is the word and? It's on your hand. Oh, it's on your hand. Oh, okay, so you're like, I have no idea. It is a coordinating conjunction. Yes, because there are subordinating. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, my English teachers. Okay. But coordinating conjunctions, I thought this was so cool. They, they join together words or groups of words that are of equal importance or weight. So when you see a word like and, you have to look at what comes before it and what comes after it and realize that they are joined together equally. So we can't just stop at being still. What is the whole picture that God is telling us? He is saying, son or daughter, cease striving, be still, 
quiet your soul and know that I am God. We cannot have one without the other. And that's principle number one for us this morning. We can't know that he's God if we don't learn how to be still. What a powerful statement. This is no small thing. And do you see the irony? We have never had a generation who was more confused about who God is. But we've also never had a culture that is less still. We are the most wired, stressed out, exhausted, busy, and unhealthy with rest generation that has ever been. We have more people who can't sit still, can't unwind, can't unplug, can't set our phones down for five minutes. But we also have a world of people who are 100% confused about who God is. And the problem is if we don't know who God is, principle number two, if we don't learn to be still before him, we believe lies about his character. This is the age old trick of the enemy. We know we started this back in the book of Genesis. Did God really say if we aren't still and knowing that he is God, then it's easy to be, to believe lies about who he said he is. We've all heard things like this before. And perhaps we've even said some, if God is a God of love, then surely I can love anyone. And he puts his stamp of approval on it. If God is truly loving, like I've heard, then there can't be anything past this life besides heaven, right? We should all be there. If he's good, then I shouldn't have had to lose that baby. I shouldn't have lost my job. I shouldn't have been abandoned. I shouldn't have been rejected. I shouldn't have had to go through that divorce. And we say all of these things because we're believing lies about the character of God. We have lost the ability to be still and know that he is God. It reminds me of a story from when I was a child or really just a general, uh, generalization of me when I was a child. And I don't know if any of you guys were like me, a little mischievous, a little devious. But if I ever came across a little, a little dirt mound, shall you, where you kind of know what's going on in there, little ants doing their thing. If you were like me, you couldn't pass it up without kicking it over and watching all the ants go crazy. Got a little bit of joy out of it. I still do. Not gonna lie. Not gonna lie. Still do it sometimes. I don't like ants. So I'm like, you're watching them scurry. And then the few outliers are like, yeah, yeah. You know, killing them. <laughs> and uh, come on, how many of you are with me? You're, I'm not alone here. I know some of you guys are like, that's so mean. I'm sorry. No offense. None. Hey, good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> But I think this is a picture of where we are uh, in a lot of ways as society as a whole. We get some dirt kicked up in our lives. We go through things and then we just run around like crazy little ants. And eventually we point our finger at God because we don't know who he is and how incredible his plan is for our lives. And I'm here to remind you and to remind me that we need so many more moments of stillness before God. But I realize that we don't all know what that looks like to be still. And if I've learned anything at Liberty Church in my, as you all heard, (laughs) 20 years, I have loved that every message has come with a practical application for our life. It's not just this lofty teaching that we're like, how do you, how do you apply this? But what does it look like? So let's look first, what being still isn't. Because our society has gotten a glimpse of how we need to take a pause. We need to stop a little bit. We need to slow down. But without God, we always get it twisted. We always get it wrong. Being still isn't watching Netflix all day, or Disney Plus, or Amazon Prime, or Hulu, or Paramount Plus, or, 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 can't think of any more, but there's so many. It isn't scrolling through our phones. It isn't binge watching our favorite movies. It isn't even playing video games. But can I say that it isn't even things that actually enhance us or refresh us? This one is beyond me, but Pastor John Bradley, um, yard work. It's not yard work. It isn't exercise. It isn't sports, not playing instruments, picking up a hobby, sewing, playing board games, or even going on vacation. And now hear me, those last things are refreshing and things that bring us rest physically and emotionally. But principle number three, knowing that he is God comes from a place of being still in your spirit. It's the refreshing that we most often neglect. We might take care of our bodies. We might listen to that, that internal clock that tells us to slow down. But some, somehow we ignore the temperature of our spirit and our emotions, therefore, as well. I want to look at a different, little bit of a different angle, the story of Mary and Martha, because God has been speaking to me about this one for a long time. We all know it. 
Let's look at it. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha, who was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Sounds kind of like the disciples. Don't you care that I'm drowning? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Now, if you are like me, the story has driven you crazy. Four years as a child, as a teenager, and as a young adult, I was mad at Mary. I, I resonated with Martha, and I'm like, how could you? She is working, and she's doing extra work. Why? Because you are not helping her. And that would frustrate me. Just sitting still isn't necessarily part of my nature. However, as I've processed this for years, and the Lord has spoken sweeter and sweeter about sitting at his feet and being more like Mary, I started to realize something. This may not be revelatory for you. This has been revelatory for me in the last couple of years. I looked at Mary as lazy and she was not lazy. God never said she stopped there and did nothing. She probably got up and worked five times faster than Martha. She knew that if she didn't set, sit at his feet, how easy it was, as the Lord said to Martha, to be distracted and concerned about the things of the world. So she knew that she had to do the most important thing first and sit at his feet. Because principle number four, being still quiets the voice of the enemy to make room for the voice of God. How many of you have ever wondered how to hear God's voice or how to hear it more clearly? It is being like Mary. She sits at his feet and listens to his word. Now, obviously he was right there before her, but the same applies to us. We cannot hear him when we are so busy with all the cares and the worries and distractions of this life, being still before him and sitting in his presence is the only thing that shuts the voice of the, of the enemy and all of the noise. And we all go through things. All of you have gone through things, hard things, and we cannot <clears throat> get through them by just running around like crazy ants. The Lord is calling us clearly and loudly, and it is time, precious saints, that we obey this sweet and powerful command. I told Stefan a couple of months ago, that sometimes I feel just kind of like a Jenga puzzle. If you know Jenga, it's usually a smaller version of this. This is for your benefit. But it's these wooden blocks, and you stack them up this way, then that way, and this way. And you either play it as a team or you play it against somebody. And as one person tries to push out one side without the whole thing crumbling, then the other person takes a turn. And at one point, I, I don't love this game. Some of you guys really do. It stresses me out because at one point the whole thing falls over and it's just, ah. Um, but I told him, I said, I feel a little bit like a Jenga puzzle sometimes where a couple things happen and I'm okay. You know, you poked out one side, you poked out another. A couple things might go wrong, but all of a sudden something happens it takes one thing on a given day and my world completely crumbles. One discouraging word, one frustrating circumstance, one thing, sometimes bigger, sometimes very minute, if I'm honest. And, and it all comes crashing down. Maybe you relate. Maybe you've gotten up before and you know you prayed on the armor of God and you had your Bible time and you're like, okay, we're doing, we're doing well here. And then something comes along. You're like, okay, maybe one of your kids got up real grumpy. And you're like, okay, it's going to be fine, Lord. All right, we're still good. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Maybe then you get to work or you work from home and you're like, you get accosted with some email and somebody's fussing at you and frustrated about something. You're like, it's okay. I'm praising him. The Lord is good. He's got me. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe then you get some call from your spouse or something. Oh, okay. Or you got a bad test grade on some class. You're like, all right, it's going to be fine. I'm going to find one here. All right, bad test, great. It's okay. The Lord is still good. He's got me. He's faithful. And then maybe you get that phone call that you got a family member who's dying of cancer. Or maybe it's just one of those days and you have a situation where somebody cuts you off in traffic and it was just too much. But maybe it is that serious word. And all of a sudden, I know it makes me jump too. You crumble a little bit. But oh, my friends, I'm here to remind us all that it is in that stillness, it is in that secret place where we learn again and again to know that he is God, that he is good, and he will put us back together. 
over and over again. It's when we have this inside us or around us and we steal away like Mary, not neglecting these things. We know we've got to deal with it. We know we got to deal with the bills, the house, the kids, all of that stuff. We got to deal with it. But we realize that if we don't first run away like Mary and sit at his feet and let him just heal us and speak to us and work through all these things, we're going to end up right back here in a week, in a day, in a couple of minutes. See, when we ignore his beautiful invitation to the stillness, then we allow those moments of brokenness to define us instead of to refine us. I'm going to say that again. When you ignore, when I ignore his beautiful invitation, his command to being still before him, then we allow these things to define who we are instead of to refine us and make us more like him. It's where we fall apart and our emotions explode and we just decide I'm always going to be that person with the exploding temper. That's just, that's just who I am. It's who I'm going to be. Or you've been beaten down and the cares of this world and all these things and you just accept I'm just always going to be a mess. I'm always going to be discouraged. I'm always going to fight depression. Always. That's who I am. And we let these things define us instead of running here and letting him refine and refine and refine and do what, do what he does. Because principle number five, when we choose to run to the secret place, he not only shows us that he's God, he destroys the lies about his character, he fights for us. Remember in Exodus, when the Israelites have left Egypt with Pharaoh's permission, and then all of a sudden the Egyptians change their mind. They're following the Israelites and the Israelites picture it just like the ants scurrying around, just like, just like the disciples yelling at Jesus in the boat. And just like Martha fussing at the Lord, they start freaking out. They run to Moses and they're like, what? They're following us. We should never have left Egypt. We should have stayed there. Okay. Cause that was so great. But again, they are totally, totally freaking out that they're going to be captured but Moses, someone who knew beyond any of us what it was like to be in the secret place or the stillness of God, what does he say? He answered the people. He said, don't be afraid. Stand firm. You will see how the Lord will save you today. Do you see those Egyptians? You will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. Just be still. Woo, I don't know about you guys, but that makes me want to like run around the church and go a little bit crazy. What a promise from God that when we learn how to, to be still, to carve out this, pre this time in his presence before us, that we, we get him to fight for us. We get him to ward off the attacks of the enemy, the attacks from people, and he fights for us. We know the story of what happens. They all end up drowning in the river, in the big, huge sea. That's incredible. And the, the important thing for us to get as we get a hold of this is number six, principle number six, when we learn how to be still and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is God, then our call becomes to help others do the same. We live in a world of people who are so lost, who do not know our God, even some who claim to. They do not know what it means to be still. So once we have learned to do this. When this comes that we run here over and over again, it's our call, believers, body of Christ, to go and help others. A special side note specifically for you moms today, there is no higher calling for us than to teach our kids how to do this because this happens all the time in their world. To show them what it's like to be still, to sit at God's feet, and to know no matter what rage is around them that their God is real, he's trustworthy, and he's good. There is no higher calling we have as, as parents and as moms. And as we have been in a series on teaching about the gifts, and uh, we will, we, the last few weeks, and then we will continue in that in the next few weeks, these are those moments that when we know how to be still, we hear the voice of the Lord speaking over us, the gifts he's placed inside of us, but that we can call those out in our children where the world or they might see it as a negative, that you see this strong willed, always pushing back, all these, always got to question everything, but you can say, no, you are a person of discernment. You walk in, in uh, leadership gifts. You have all of these things or, oh, you're weak and you just don't, you don't fit in this mold. And you're like, no, you have a gift of mercy or of serving and stop letting our words or the world's words define them or let them see these as negatives, but we can pull out these gifts inside of them. Come on, somebody say amen. <laughs> oh, what a calling. 
I want to close this morning. Uh, I know it's typically our soaking weekend and we're not doing it quite the same as usual, but we've been talking about being still. So we are going to practice that this morning. I want to just encourage you stillness for me. I'm a big checklist person. Stillness is the time you come before him with no agenda nothing. This is not actually my prayer time. This is not my Bible time. This is not my worship time or my list of things because I love my little checklists and my check marks. But sometimes we do all those and we wonder why we're still a little dry. And he's calling us away to a little bit deeper where we throw away the agenda and just say, I'm just going to sit at your feet. No agenda. And I'm going to talk to you and you're going to talk to me. And I might unwind about the goings on of my day. I might just praise him. I might just sit completely still. I've been doing this for a few weeks, totally separate from my time, my other time with him. And I only have done five to 15 minutes. I put on a song. I really love this album. He's got actually many, um, but just for any of you guys who are like me and just want a soft, calming, instrumental uh, CD, this one is great, Soaking in His Presence. And some of the songs on there are short. Some of them are really long. And I just put one on so I don't even think about it. Once it's over, I know that that's my time unless I get pulled into more, which is a, which is a great thing. But choosing that just helps me quiet my brain so I know that I am doing nothing, no checklist, no nothing, but sitting before him and letting him do all those things that he promised, the fighting for us, reminding my soul when I need to be reminded that he is God. We have all watched people who follow Jesus, who love Jesus. Some of you might even be in here today struggling with that, but we've all known people who at one point loved him and now they're away from him. And I dare say for some of them, it may be they watched one piece too many come out. And instead of taking this and saying, God, I don't understand, help me. I'm going to sit before you. I'm going to learn of the stillness. They just walked away instead of knowing that sweet moment of stillness where he rebuilds us over and over again. See, I've been there. You've been there. I've been betrayed by people. I have been beaten down, discouraged. I've watched my father die to cancer. I've held my 18-week-old baby in my arms just to say goodbye. I've deeply loved students in 5979 to see them go too soon. But can I tell you something today? more powerful than any pain that I've experienced, more life-changing than any struggles I've gone through. It's the secret of this stillness to sit before the Lord and let him heal me and free my soul over and over again. He is inviting each of us to this today, Liberty Church. I'm going to close out in prayer and then we'll spend just a few minutes. You can choose two, five, ten, It doesn't matter. You're welcome to come up to the altar or stay in your seats. But I just want us to take a few moments with no agenda that you just sit before him. Quietly talk to him. Listen for him. No agenda. We take just a few moments. Also, before you leave today, I want all of you to come up to the the front before you leave and grab, yes, I have the actual size Jenga piece puzzles. And there's Sharpies on here. And I want you to take one. There's enough for everybody to take one. And to be reminded that when you see this and you feel like your world is crashing down or the storms of life are too much, that you remember where to run. You remember that when it feels too much to handle, that you come back and you sit at his feet and you let him work through the areas of pain, work through the grief, all of the emotions, all of the struggles, all the things that we frequently shut down and wonder why we're not okay. You can write anything. There's Sharpies up here. You can write Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God, whatever you want to. But I want this to serve as a reminder of how big our God is and that you and I need to be still like we have never been still. And it's a fight, you know, in the world we live in. It is a fight. So we're going to pray together. I even want our our leaders to just get to enjoy this today. After a few minutes, uh, P.S. and I will be up to at the front to pray with anybody who might have urgent prayer requests. But we're going to pray. We're going to soak in his presence for a few minutes. And then please, before you leave, grab one of these and and write something on it. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and for your command to be still and know that you are God. Lord, we thank you that you are so good. Lord, would you remind us and call us away over and over again and let us Refuse to let anything in our lives or our schedules keep us from these moments with you. 
where we sit at your feet, that we are reminded that you are our shepherd. We lack nothing. That you make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside the still waters. And you restore our soul. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of stillness. Would you speak clearly and sweetly to us today as we sit before you and we are reminded who fights for us, who builds us back up time and time again. All we have to do is be like Mary and come and sit at your feet. I thank you for every person in this place. I pray that you will bless them, that you will restore them, that you will minister deeply to their spirits today, that you will recharge our spirits, Lord, and that we will be still and know that we know that we know, no matter what storms rage, that you are God, you are good, and you are with us. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's take just a few moments.